Thank you so much, George. Uh, this time I'm going to, and I don't know if you can juggle uh, doing two things at once, but as you pass the offering bags, would you also please open your Bibles? And uh, we're going to be reading through a, a text, a bit of a lengthy text, actually, in 1 John chapter 3. So if you would just take your Bibles right now, and uh, Dave's got some Bibles, just put your hand in the air if you forgot yours, as I often forget mine. And uh, we would love to get a Bible to you so that you can look it up with us. The uh, page on the Bibles we're giving you are uh, 1,739. And uh, in your own Bibles, just look for 1 John 3. We'll begin in verse 1. Let's just uh, give you a few moments to look that up. All right. Please read along with me. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we'll, we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who breaks the law... In fact, sin, sorry, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with word or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us. We have confidence before God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, we're in this series on 1 John that we're calling confidence, a firm footing in Christ. And confidence, true confidence, is what John's epistle is all about here. This is why he ends this last section that we looked at last week. He says, and now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. And so again, now John is introducing a new aspect of confidence that we can have. The confidence to approach God. The confidence to be in God's presence. The confidence to know that all of our sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus. The confidence to know that when Jesus returns, we are going to run to him and he is going to run to us. And we are forever going to be swept up into his embrace and live for all eternity in his glorious presence. Now that, my friends, is confidence. So this morning, we're going to look at this important aspect of confidence that Christians can enjoy, both now and forevermore, the confidence to rest in God's presence. I remember when my kids were little. This was before this building existed, before we even rented space 
uh, office space above the Scotiabank in town here. I worked from home, and I loved it. The commute was wonderful. And I, uh, most mornings, would grab a coffee, make my way down to the basement, and I would begin to do my work after closing the door. And it was great until my daughter got to be about three years old, and she started realizing that I was behind the door, even though the door was closed. You know what I mean? And I don't know if you know this, but there's absolutely nothing more persistent than a three-year-old who knows that you're on the other side of that door. And I love my home office, but eventually we were forced to sort of find an office to rent in town here. And I dare say it was because of the bold confidence of a little child who knew I was in there and would not stop knocking. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Daddy! Daddy! You know, my friends, okay? This is the kind of confidence that we can have. Just like that three-year-old child will confidently knock on the door knowing that eventually daddy's going to get up and hold her in, her, in, in his arms. We can have bold confidence to approach God in prayer. Tremendous bold confidence to come to the table and to participate in communion. We can know that he will remember our sin no more. We can know that he will embrace us and welcome us into his presence. Now, I emphasize this because too many Christians do not have that confidence. They truly feel like God does not welcome them, does not want them to draw near to him. They're racked by feelings of guilt and shame. And unworthiness, believing God doesn't like me. He doesn't want me to be around. And they'll come even to a communion service like this. Christians who will not come forward to receive communion because they feel unworthy. Today I want to give you five reasons why every Christian can be confident to come into and rest in God's presence. So here are five reasons why we can rest in God's presence today. First reason is our new identity. 1 John chapter 3 starts by saying this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not even yet been made known. Now, this is the starting point for confidence that's built on Christ. At the start of his gospel, John said that those who believe in Jesus and receive Jesus as their Savior can have the right to call themselves the children of God. And now we see here that this Father is one who lavishes his children with his love. You know, um, one time I had a woman in my office who was feeling, as we all do from time to time, feeling like a failure. And by the way, I have her permission to share this story. And we, she shared just that sense of guilt. She says, I have a devotional problem. She says, I, I don't pray as much as I should. I, I don't read my Bible as much as I should. I'm not a good Christian. And, and I said to her, you know, it seems strange to me that you would feel guilty when you miss your time with the Lord. And she said, what do you mean? I, I said, I would think that if you miss time with the Lord, you wouldn't feel guilty so much. You would, f you would just feel like you missed him. And she wasn't sure what I meant. So we turned to this text in John chapter 3. And it says that the Father has lavished his love upon us. And I said, what would a lavish Christmas gift look like? And she thought of something that would be far above anything you might dream of or hope for, like a, a new car. I said, what would a lavish meal look like? And you could imagine a spread like no other, mountains of filet mignon and creme brulee. I said, what would it look like if you were with someone whose love was like that, so lavish? And we began to imagine together someone who could just love you with that unconditional, consistent love that you're just longing to be loved. I said, if you missed meeting someone like that, would you feel guilty or would you more feel just like, hmm, I missed it? She said, I would say, 
I would feel more like, oh, I missed it. <laughs> like, shoot. I said, why is that? And she said, it's because it would be just so wonderful to be with somebody like that. And after prayer, after that, we spent some time listening prayer. And we asked the father to just lavish her with his love. And, and, and the father began to speak to her heart about the most encouraging thing. She asked the Lord for, I think it was three encouraging words, and the Lord gave her 30. And, and I said, what kind of father would give you 30 encouraging words when all you asked for was three? She said, I guess he's kind of lavish in his love. And then what she said next surprised me. She just sort of said, kind of a little bit abruptly, she said, can I go home now? And I thought, oh no, is it something I said? She said, no, I just want to go home and read my Bible and pray. And I said, devotional problem solved. <laughs> See, we've been given a new identity when we came to Christ. When we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that he paid the debt of our sin and trusted in that. We were born again, as Jesus calls it in John 3, in that we were given a whole new identity. We became a new person united with Christ. But we do still have to embrace that identity as a child of God. And I believe the best way is to read the truth of Scripture and to listen. Because in the secret place, the Spirit will testify with our spirit that we are God's dearly loved children. And to the extent extent that we absorb that identity as our own, we're going to have a true confidence that is rooted in the firm footing of what God thinks of us and not what the world thinks or what our heart thinks of us. And so in those moments when you feel discouraged or you feel guilty and you don't feel like you can even draw near to God, we have this confidence that we can in fact rest in his presence because of that new identity that we've been given as one who's a dearly loved child of God. What else? Here's another reason why we can rest in God's presence because of our wonderful destiny. John writes, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he, as he truly is. And the truth of the matter is that none of us right now is without sin. And the hope that we have is that one day, we're not going to sin anymore because the moment we see Jesus and he appears at his second coming, we will be like him. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And we can now feel at rest in his presence whenever we feel that we have failed him in some way because we know there's a day coming when Jesus will look at us and he will finish what he started. And we will become like him. For we shall see him as he is. With this glorious future in mind, dear Christian, what do you do when the devil whispers in your ear, you're not good enough to pray. You're not good enough to come to church. You're not good enough to take communion. You can say, get behind me, Satan. I'm a child of God. Of course I'm not good enough. Christ was good enough for me. And one day I will be made perfect. Are there any other reasons why Christ followers can confidently draw near to God and rest in his presence? Here's another reason for you to consider. My friends, this is where we find true confidence, okay? Our acceptable, sorry, our accessible fellowship. John writes, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, it surprises me a little because I read it and I think, John, you know it's Jesus who purified us. Like, at the moment we became a Christian, we were totally purified. And we had all the righteousness of Jesus. And I thought, I was purified once and for all when I came to faith in Christ. How then am I supposed to purify myself now? Do you follow me? Do you understand the debate? And it puzzled me. So I went back and I studied purification in the Old Testament. And I learned there were a lot of times that the Israelites were told to purify themselves. If you touched a dead body, or if a couple just had sex, or if a woman just came through childbirth, you had to purify yourself afterwards. Even the temple had to be purified on a regular basis. And so we get the sense, reading the Old Testament, that living in this world of sin just means that you need to regularly be purified in order to enter into the presence of a holy God. Now, please, please understand, the people of Israel didn't purify themselves in order to be saved. They were God's children before, 
during, and after the process of purification. The reason they purified themselves was so that they could enter into the temple of the Lord and be in the presence of God in their local synagogue. We move now into the New Testament, and the command to purify yourself remains, but the way we do it now is slightly different. And again, we don't do this because we want to be saved. We're already saved. We do this to restore fellowship, to, to restore our intimacy or our closeness to God. How do we purify ourselves today as John tells us to do in this verse? It's simple. We confess our sins and we affirm our confidence in God's grace. This is what we do as Christians on a regular basis. You see, there are a number of places in the New Testament where it tells us to purify ourselves, and it always has to do with saying that we're sorry, confessing our sins, repenting, that is turning away from our sins, and turning toward the grace of God, and just enjoying that grace afresh. To the Corinthians, Paul writes, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. What does that mean? How do we do this? Well, the rest of the chapter talks about the importance of confessing and repenting and being sorry for our sins. This is where Paul writes, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. And so what does it mean to purify ourselves in the New Testament? It means to be sorry for the wrong things that we do. We confess, we admit what we've done wrong, we turn away from that, we turn toward God and receive his gift of grace. Again, we don't do this because we're worried that we've stopped being God's child when we sinned. We purify ourselves through the act of confession, entering just back into that sweet space of fellowship with God. James makes the same point in his letter. He writes, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. How do we do this? How do we purify our hearts? Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is how we wash our hands. This is how we purify our hearts. We're sorry for the wrong things that we do. We confess them to God and then we also receive afresh that assurance of grace. Perhaps the best description of this is found earlier in John's epistle. He writes, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you know, as Christians, we often feel terrible about the things that we do. I know I do. We steal, we lie, we're selfish, we're proud, we're angry, we're rude. We maybe don't do them as much as we used to. And when we do these things, we're not acting out who we are in Christ. But still we do these things and sometimes there's that feeling of guilt that causes us to hide from God, like to put on the fig leaves like Adam and Eve. And the good news is, my friends, we don't have to stay away in those moments. This verse promises that you just confess your sins and God says he'll forgive you and purify you from all unrighteousness. And so when we skip a couple of pages then to 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, and it says all who have this hope in him, purify themselves. We know that what John is talking about here, he's not saying you need to become a Christian again, okay? He's saying those who are looking forward to Jesus' return will confess their sins and draw near to God. See, it's important to realize that there are actually two kinds of forgiveness in the New Testament. Follow me here, guys, okay? This is a bit deep. There's judicial forgiveness, but there's also relational forgiveness. There's a judicial forgiveness that we receive the moment we become a Christian. That's the legal pardon that you receive once and for all. You don't have to keep asking God to give you judicial forgiveness because the moment you receive Jesus as your Savior, He, as our judge, transferred all of our sins onto Jesus who died and paid the penalty once and for all. Please understand, though, that's not the kind of forgiveness John is talking about here in John 1.9, 1 John 1.9. It's not the purification that John is talking about in chapter 3, verse 3. John is not saying, confess your sins because somehow you've lost your salvation and you need God, the judge, to give you judicial forgiveness again. No, here he's talking about a different kind of forgiveness now. He's talking about relational forgiveness because God is not just your judge, he's also your father. And this is where you say that you're sorry. You confess 
and you repent and you receive God's grace afresh. It's the kind of forgiveness that John is talking about in 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sins. And in this sense, God forgives you and purifies you. It's not judicial forgiveness. It's relational forgiveness. It's not saving you. It's restoring you back into the intimate fellowship that God wants you to enjoy. This is how we purify ourselves as Christians and we draw near to God. Now, there are a number of places in the New Testament where this relational forgiveness is spoken of. Let me give you a few examples. Matthew 6, Jesus says to his disciples, Pray this way, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, we go, why do I pray, forgive me of my sins? I'm already forgiven. But see, the Christian who prays the Lord's Prayer is not asking for judicial forgiveness to be saved. They are simply asking for relational forgiveness, restoring them to intimate communion with God. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer becomes a Christian in the province of Samaria, and it says there that he believed and was baptized. So he's a true Christian, but a moment later, he did something that was very troubling. He watched as Peter and John were laying hands on people and filling them with the Spirit, or they were being filled with the Spirit, and he offered them money if he could have the same power. And again, he's a Christian, but he's a baby Christian, and he needs to be challenged with that thinking. And so Peter says, repent of this wickedness, Simon, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you. And we go, well, hold on a second. He is a believer. He is forgiven. Why does he have to pray and ask God to forgive him? We have to remember there are two kinds of forgiveness in the New Testament. There's judicial, legal forgiveness. Simon already received that from God when he trusted in Christ. That forgiveness was given to him once and for all. He didn't have to ask for that forgiveness again, but there was a relational forgiveness that Simon needed whenever he sinned, just like you and I. Simon was still a child of God. He always would be, but intimate fellowship with God was interrupted and needed to be restored. He was a true believer, and Simon repented immediately because as it says in our text today, all who have this hope will purify themselves. Now, these two kinds of forgiveness are beautifully demonstrated in the story where Jesus washed his disciples' feet in John chapter 13. And you might might remember Jesus, before he died on the cross, he welcomed his disciples into the fellowship of that upper room. And it was a symbol that he used of washing their feet that symbolized that he would be the one to wash them of sin. It was reminiscent of priests in the Old Testament who would wash their hands and feet at the laver after going from the outer courts and moving into the inner courts. So Jesus comes to Peter, and Peter, first of all, says, no, no, you're not going to wash me. I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, you're going to have to let me do this. And so Peter then says, all right, then wash all of me. And Jesus says something interesting. He says, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean. See, the bath that Jesus is speaking about there is the judicial forgiveness. We receive this when we come to Christ and trust in him. Peter was clean because of his faith in Christ. But still there was a problem. If Peter wanted to come in the room, sit at the meal, have close intimate fellowship in that culture, he had to have his feet cleaned. That foot washing is not judicial forgiveness because Peter's already had a bath. He's already saved. He's already cleaned. The washing of Peter's feet is a symbol of the relational forgiveness that Peter needed. Do you understand the difference? Now, friends, in much the same way, we sin every day. And those who have a hope in Jesus' return will make a habit of letting Jesus wash their feet through confession of sin. They don't need a bath. They don't need judicial forgiveness. They don't need to be saved. But they need their feet to be cleaned, to experience relational Forgiveness. That's, how, that's why we can pray the Lord's Prayer. Father, forgive us as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And so when we come to the table of communion, it's essential that we let Jesus wash our feet. We examine our hearts. We confess our sins. But why? Do we do this because we're worried that we're no longer God's children and he no longer loves us because we just sinned? No. Of course not. We let him wash our feet because we are those who have confidence that we can enter into this Passover meal, this upper room, 
This holy of holies. Because we are those who have received grace upon grace. And by the way, when Jesus says at the end, I want you to wash the feet of one another. He's not talking about actually washing people's feet. As some have taken it. And he's not even talking about just serving each other, which that's the way I've preached it before. But that's not really what he's talking about here, actually. I've learned. He's saying, I want you to offer relational forgiveness to one another. When Jesus says, I want you to wash each other's feet, what he's really saying is, I want you to confess your sins to each other. When you've hurt somebody, say you're sorry. And when somebody comes to you and says they're sorry in the church, I want you to forgive them. In doing so, we wash one another's feet as he's washed ours. It's a bit like my relationship with my wife, Krista. When it comes to God and I, when I sin against Krista, it's not like I stop being her husband. It's not like we stop being married, but I have to admit what I did wrong. Otherwise, there's a chill in the room that has nothing to do with the thermostat. I have to be sorry for hurting her. And what happens is, it's not that we get remarried again, it's that our fellowship is renewed. We never stop being married, but the closeness wasn't there. I had to admit, my feet are dirty, sweetheart. And I had to confess my sin. She had to forgive me, offering relational forgiveness, washing my feet. See, relational forgiveness is what Jesus is talking about in 1 John 1, 9. John writes, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us. What kind of forgiveness is in mind here? What kind of purification is in mind? It's not judicial purification forgiveness. It's relational purification forgiveness. As we enter into God's presence with confidence, the holy of holies. My friends, in those moments when you feel terrible because of what you've done, you can have tremendous confidence to rest in God's presence because you have the most amazing, accessible fellowship with God. You draw near through the simplest of things, through confession, I did it, through confession, through repentance. As you say, I don't want to do this anymore, and you receive afresh God's grace in that moment. There's no reason for a Christian not to come forward and to participate in communion if they're willing to confess their sins and repent and receive God's grace. Number four, reason why we can approach God is because of our changed lives. So if you follow along in your Bibles, let's read in verse four, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sin and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Something I want to clear up right away. This chapter talks a lot about sin right now. If we're not careful, we're going to read it with a North American English uh, mind, and we're going to get the wrong impression. So when John says, underline this in your Bible, everyone who sins here. When he says, no one who keeps, lives in him keeps on sinning. When he talks about continuing to sin, that does not mean that true Christians don't sin anymore, okay? Remember in the first chapter, John said, if you, if you say you have no sin, you lie. Remember in the second chapter, John said that if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus who will stand up for you. So there's, there's no way John is saying here that as a Christian, you are going to somehow get to the point where you don't sin anymore. The word for sin in the original Greek is, and we don't know this when we read it, so I'm telling you, it's in the present continuous tense. It means to go on, to practice sin, to continue, to remain unchanged over time. That's what he's talking about here. John is talking about the change that Christians will experience over time. He says true Christians will change. They always change. We don't get perfect, but as we confess our sins, as we turn away from the wrong things, as we receive God's grace in the moment... This is more about what God does than what we do. We change because the Spirit is in us. He's changing our desires, transforming our minds, guiding us into truth. I've never talked to a Christian who said to me, you know what, there's been no change in my life. And we've never baptized somebody up here who says, and since I became Christian, pretty much the same. We're not perfect, but over time we're changed. Skipping down to verse 9, John writes this, No one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. Again, this is in the present continuous tense. God, so underline where John says continue to sin or cannot go on sinning, John is saying you're not going to stay exactly the same. 
you're not going to continue doing all the things you did before. Over the course of your life as a follower of Jesus, you're going to want to change. You're going to become more like Christ. Not perfectly, but increasingly. You can't keep on sinning exactly like you used to. Because why? Because God is at work in your life. Be encouraged, Christian. And so here's another reason why you can enter into the presence of the Lord today. If you're a follower of Jesus, no matter how badly you may have behaved lately, you can look back on the course of your life and you can see that God has planted the seed of his spirit in you. God, not you, God has made some changes. Please understand, we're not confident to enter God's presence because of what we've done. We're confident because we can look back and we can say, it's not our performance, it's his performance in us. He's been changing us. I like to say it this way, I'm not yet the person I want to be. I'm not yet the person I hope to be, but praise God, I'm not the person I used to be. Everybody who's a follower of Jesus can claim this to be the case because of the seed that that God planted in your heart. And when God plants a seed, we know when God plants a seed that that seed will grow. Now, my iPad just died as I thought it might. So I'm going to just see if I can find my place here in my notes. What is it that starts to grow? John tells us this. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. And so what, lo- what grows is God's love. John writes in verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words of speech, but in actions and in truth. You know, the early church father, Jerome, said that the apostle John was totally fixated on this message of Christians loving each other at the end of his life. Jerome said that when John the apostle was very old and he was very infirm and he could no longer preach, he would still say to everybody who would listen to him, he would go around and just say, little children, love one another. And I've seen that in my pastoral ministry too. The more that a A a mature Christian gets closer to the grave, the more they will just fixate on the simple message of God's love. It seems to me that if you have one foot in heaven and you're almost ready to take your last breath, your mind sharpens wonderfully on that which is most important. And I've seen this again and again. Christians at the end of their lives are absolutely fixated on what is most important. Little children love one another. And you'll hear them say this because they are dialed into the frequency of heaven. Little children, love one another. And so we have confidence to come into God's presence. No matter how how bad we feel, no matter how bad our performance, we know that we're welcome. Let me leave you with one more reason this morning, and that is His amazing grace. This Thanksgiving, I hope that you'll be released to thank and praise God for the incredible invitation that you've been given to come near to God. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, his inexhaustible grace. John sums up his teaching by saying, this is how we know we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. See, everything John has been saying up until this point is so that you know that you're welcome in God's presence, okay? If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, God looks upon you with his love. He knows that you're his He welcomes you to the table to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And you don't have to stay away, even if you have a heart that condemns you today. John writes, writes, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our condemning hearts. And he knows everything, whereas your heart doesn't. Perhaps everything we've spoken about this morning has not been enough To take away this deeply ingrained feeling that you're not worthy to come into the presence of God. Perhaps you've tried to remind yourself that you have a new identity as God's love child. Perhaps you know that you have a wonderful identity and you'll be made perfect one day. Perhaps you've even confessed your sins, purified yourself, and been reminded of God's amazing grace. Perhaps you've even reflected on your life and you can see that God's Spirit has been walking with you and you're not the person you used to do. 
you used to be because of what God has done, but still, still, still maybe today you have a heart that condemns you. A heart that screams, you're not welcome at the table. You're not welcome to pray and to worship the Lord. I want to remind you, that's not God's voice to you, dear Christian. I want you to, remind, to be reminded today that if your heart condemns you, if it's racked by guilt and shame, Christian, I'm asking you to put one foot in front of the other. And come up here and take of this bread and drink of this cup, entering into sweet fellowship, even though you may not feel loved. How can you do this? Because you know that God is greater than your condemning heart. And God knows more than you do. This moment, my friend, is an important moment. You must preach the gospel to yourself, my friend. Preach to your condemning heart that God is greater. Christ's sacrifice is stronger. His grace is greater than your sin. And come to the table. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. God wants your heart to be transformed so that it no longer condemns you. So that you have a heart that is confident like a child. Daddy, 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 Daddy. That you will enter into and rest in his presence today. Let me pray. Father, would you just please speak to our hearts that we would reflect on the truth that you've given us in this moment today. Father, as we come before you, we, we ask you to, conf- to lead us as we confess our sins. And Lord, we pray that we would stay on the line after confession to hear your words of forgiveness and fellowship and love. Thank you, Father, for your judicial forgiveness that we celebrate here at the table. But we also felt, thank you, Father, for your relational forgiveness. We accept that as well. And we cry, Daddy, Father, Abba, 